Hey everybody, so today we are going to be going over how do you do statement validation for your knowledge graph. There's a lot of reasons that you might wanna do this. If you are one of the folks that thinks that, you know, because you're sourcing data for your knowledge graph from internal sources or licensed sources, licensed data sets, it should all be correct. That's not true. And if you are using this for anything that's critical, like your reporting or maybe feeding this information to the LLM because you want to, you know, help with the hallucination problem, which is another reason that people are really looking at this specific topic. This is something that we're going to walk through today. A lot of what we're walking through today is founded long, long time ago in regular scholarship. So when you're doing research, you want to be evidence-based, right? So when you look for evidence, you're looking for other authors or other projects that support the claims that you are making, or they have claims that can also be reproduced or supported. That's essentially the same methodology we're going to be using today. So I'm going to be walking through the exact process that I have used in many organizations. It has worked really, really well for this with verifying what is coming from a graph for verifying and helping the LLM not do so many hallucinations. And this is also something that I've used to verify um, different news sources coming in to see if uh, a claim from a news source can be corroborated with other data points. So these are all areas that this process should be helpful for. All right, so if this sounds interesting to you. Let's go get started. All right, so we are going to go through this step by step, and I'm going to explain each step so that you understand what each one is doing. And also, I am going to put uh, a link in the description bar below to the whole diagram that I'm going through here. So don't worry about taking screenshots as you go. The whole thing is down below if you want to go check that out. Okay, so the first area is really, really important, and that is doing a source and that would be from data sources or unstructured. Uh, you need to do an audit of all of those that are going to be ingested and used in your knowledge graph. Even if you don't do anything else, you should do that anyways. <laughs> that is a really important thing so that you have the provenance of all of your, your information in your knowledge graph. And that's going to be then used to do your source tier list. So what you're doing here is at first you're looking at your unstructured. So these are supposed to have some kind of metadata associated with them. And if they're not, you're going to have to add some. And if you missed my why is taxonomy useful in the AI space, link up above here. Uh, this is a really big part of that. And that is you need to be able to identify what your coverage is of any given topic or thing in your graph. And a, a big way to do that is to be able to look at the data sources or the documents, if it's unstructured, uh, that you're using in your knowledge graph. That also helps you in the LLM space because if your LLM is failing in a lot of medical areas, well, now you can go back to your sources and see how much medical content do you actually have or how much medical uh, statements. And again, that statement is like Tom Cruise, birth date, date of birth, right? Like that is a statement. Um, how much of that do you have in the medical space? Maybe that's why you're having hallucinations. You just don't have enough data to help it. Um, so this is a big important part. Maybe these unstructured data sources are coming from machine learning models that you've used that data to train. And if so, it would be really helpful to have not just the confidence score, which is what the machine the model thinks that it did on its test, right? So it's looking at, did I get the, the right answer for whatever the output is, but also the accuracy score, which is, and then do the humans agree with that confidence score? So some of that information is really helpful to have because you can use that in identifying how trustworthy some of these sources are uh, when you get farther into this process. Then in the data set side, there's a whole lot of, potential landmines in your ETL. This is one of those things that I have seen so many times. People come back and say, oh, you know, and I've used this process. I've used what we're going through here multiple times. <laughs> and almost always, why are we getting so many errors? I don't know why this data source is really high quality. Why is it, what's happening here? So if you think that you're licensing data and therefore it is all good and factual and accurate, it's not. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's not. It's much higher quality than something you would just scrape from the web. Chances are, if you are going in and looking at how the ETL was done, if you don't have documentation on the decisions that were made, and if those decisions are not queryable or accessible to kind of understand on a, on a larger scale across all your sources, what decisions were made. For instance, um, were certain fields uh, joined together and maybe that made perfect sense for the knowledge graph. But now when you're getting into understanding the trustworthiness of that statement, it's not totally trustworthy now because there's something off about it. Um, a good example of this is even like date formats. There's so many different date formats. Maybe someone took, uh, you know, legacy data that was the year of the cherry blossom. True story <laughs> that I had in my past. And they had to, to make a decision on what that means from a date perspective. Maybe they guessed wrong. So if you're finding that you're seeing a lot of invalid or uh, your, your statements in your graph and even the ones going into the LLM, and those responses that you're seeing are not as trustworthy, go check your ETL <laughs> or the people doing the ETL because oftentimes this stuff isn't written down. So that is my, my word to the wise to, to go in and, and look at that. Another area that you're gonna see here is the source ID. You really wanna make sure that you have um, that, that audit so that you have a source ID for every source you're using. And how often is it verified? How often is it updated? Um, you know, is, is it more of an opinion, uh, piece where it's more like, you know, magazines on the opinions of fashion designers, or is it from an authoritative source on fashion design, uh, education, right? Those are a little different. So making sure you have those source IDs and the information along those sources will help you with the provenance and making sure that you can reproduce or at least backtrack to where did these statements come from and how out of date are they, right? Date and time sensitive things is a part of this as well. And we'll get into that a little later. Last is if there are uh, IDs from the original data source, make sure you keep them just again, so you can backtrack to the source. And if there are issues, again, this is gonna come back to us in the last part of this process, you can push it back. We do not, you don't have to do this part, but we do not want to continue to propagate bad data, right? Let's all do ourselves a favor. So if you see bad data, <laughs> see something, say something, right? So at least if you have those IDs and you know which source they came from, you can then contact the source, the data provider, whoever they might be, and just say, hey, um, we found that there was all these errors on these statements or this data that you have in your data source. Can you like go fix it? And the reason that you want to do that um, is not only just not propagating the bad data, but also you don't want to have to fix that mistake over and over and over and over again. So if the original data source is corrected, or at least those things are taken out of the original data source, you don't have to worry about them anymore. Okay, now into the source tier list. This is really important. Now, if you were following along or are following along with the uh, Times copyright in LLM stuff, um, one, you should not be using data that you do not have the rights to use, number one. <laughs> number one, for, front and foremost. Number two, one of the things they were using in their court case was that they found out that the Times information was actually ranked and weighted higher in uh, the trustworthiness scoring of whatever LLM is under fire for that. So this is what a lot of folks do when they are doing verification on statements within not just their knowledge graph, but in the LLM space, even if they're not using a knowledge graph. So this tiered list goes back to the beginning of scholarship, right? you have something called an authoritative source. We are all taught this in our research, right? When you're doing research, you're probably not going to want to cite something that doesn't have peer review. You're not going to want to maybe cite something that cannot be verified, that it needs to be evidence-based. Um, there are lists that we are taught of, you know, like things coming from government resources, things that are coming from, 
um, citable journals and th that sort of thing are more authoritative than not. That doesn't mean they're all factual. It doesn't mean that all the statements coming th from those are going to be good quality. But what it does mean, again, that's why this whole process exists. What it does mean is it is a higher likelihood that you're going to get better data from, you know, something that has a reputation of being factual, really having a high degree of scrutiny, making sure that they really care about the data that they are providing. That stuff goes into tier one. Also, if we're talking about things, let's go down to my little note here. Um, you know, to give yourself a heads up on this, if you've never done it, you can go back to what scholars use, and which is the H index or how um, well regarded a certain journal is. Again, there's some controversy in that too. So that's why I also suggest you use something called alt metrics, which is some journals are really well done and they just maybe don't have the money to publish and get the certification of, of being in these indexes uh, that other publishers have. So looking at how trustworthy does the scholarly community see this thing? Even if you're using archive, which is not technically a journal, um, and those things are not yet necessarily peer reviewed sometimes. Um, and sometimes they're not the finished product of, or publication in, in some cases. You can still see how many people are using it and how people are talking about it. Again, that doesn't necessarily mean you trust it wholesale, but it is a good indicator that others who know about this are talking about it in a positive way. Now, if that doesn't show up at all, if, if the sources that you're looking at don't show up in those at all, one way to also get your tiered list going is looking at a sample of statements from either unstructured or structured and trying to understand if you look across all of the data sources that you're using or, you know, even having SMEs, if you don't have, if you can't find it elsewhere in other sources, having SMEs or human verified, which is a different process than just SMEs. Um, and we'll get to that in the latter part of, of this process too. They need to be able to say, yeah, I, I know this author. I know this source. Um, it's, it's really good. I looked at these statements. They are accurate. Um, all of that goes into how you're going to set up that tiered list. The other thing is you might have many lists, many lists, um, many tiered lists. And the reason for that is different use cases. If you have your knowledge graph is being used for, let's say, a medical product that you have, and then you have another one for um, medical products, meaning like, um, I don't know, vitamins or something, the trustworthiness of different sources for those two use cases, even if you have all medical sources, is going to be different. And so what do you do with this? So I've color coded this so that you can see it as we go. So tier one, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of things in tier one, only because those are like top shelf things that you really know are very trustworthy and um, out of the gate, they're, they're going to have higher quality. And by the way, data quality is not the same thing as what we're talking about here. Data quality, like I said, I think in the intro, you can have shackle shapes and other things to say, like, are the constraints being met? That does not mean the same thing as it is an accurate statement. <laughs> Right. So keep that in mind. Um, things that are, you know, maybe mixing uh, opinion pieces and, you know, letters to the editor and that kind of stuff mixed in with more, you know, let's say investigative journalism or something that might be tier two, not because it's not trustworthy, but because it mixes things that are pure opinion versus more evidence based. Um, and then tier three are things that are you know, maybe they have a few journal articles, for instance, or a few editors or authors that are just like really top notch and doing so many good things. And then they have a bunch of others that are maybe not so trustworthy or maybe not, you know, doing the best type of scholarship or evidence based research. So that's where tier three comes in. And you can decide that you don't want tier three at all, right? This is where this tier list comes in and making it to your use case. So once you get the statements, from all of these sources, you're going to then do a similarity of those statements. So here we have statement one, and we can see that source one, three, and four are contributing. What does that mean? It means that this statement or something very similar, statements very similar, 
are coming from these three different sources. So this is what you're trying to do. This is going back again to that triangulation, evidence-based. Do you have other authors? Do you have other sources that are agreeing or near agreeing with that statement? That is what you're looking at here. Does that statement show up in other resources? Because if it does, it's likely, doesn't mean it's true, it's likely that it's more trustworthy than something that you can only find in one place. Again, that doesn't mean that one's not trustworthy either. And we'll get into like how this is a reciprocal. It, you, you can go back and look at statements and see if they get more evidence and, and so on and so forth. Again, just like scholarship. Right, then you want to make sure that you do some deduplication because this is just looking at statements within the sources that are similar, but it doesn't look at does the same source give you the same statement over and over again? So that adds, um, again, some more weight. And so you can see this green and this, this orange is showing it for statement one and also statement three. So are these similar? And we'll say that 95% confident that these are similar statements. Therefore, you don't need to carry on with statement three because it's just a, a slight variation of statement one. So th that drops out as we move forward. Now we're going to go to the confidence and trustworthy weighting, which is really important here. And so you can see that the higher tiers get a higher weight, the middle tiers get an even weight, and the lower tiers actually get a negative weight. Again, you get to decide the weights that you use for this. Uh, this is just for demonstration purposes. And it gives you a score, right? So this is a score three. Now this statement, again, these are different statements going through. This statement, statement two, has um, actually a much higher uh, score because it has two of the top tiers. And so it gets a, st uh, a score of four. And then down here, you can see these are all very low level. So this is negative one. This one is very risky to put into your graph or to continue to use your graph if it's already there. So let's look at this. So this confidence weighting is based on the source tiers. That's why that area is so important. And the especially the confidence scores that you already have. Then you base the weight on the number of valid facts. Again, valid here is talking about, do they all agree? Is it evidence-based? Again, we're not saying that it's trustworthy quite yet. We're saying it's evidence-based. Um, the rarity of the fact. So that's something else that isn't necessarily a negative. Like I had mentioned earlier, maybe there is a groundbreaking statement found in a certain research article. That doesn't mean it's not trustworthy. It just means that it needs more evidence to be corroborated by others. And that could be, you know, citing that article, others talking about that article, but it's a rarity. And that doesn't mean it's bad. It actually means if you have that statement and no one else you know, that is also using LLMs has that statement, it means you have some statements that your LLM or your graph has that nobody else might have. So that's actually not a bad thing. You just need to make sure you can trust what it's, what it's doing. Um, then you're going to also be looking at the saturation in other sources. So how often does that show up in all the other sources? And that really is that similarity stuff that we were talking about, you know, based on all the different sources and the statements coming from them. You're also going to want to look at the need for the fact, and that's your gap analysis. Remember, sources have those taxonomies uh, associated with them, so you can understand if you have gaps. If you have a gap, you might be more willing to let something with a lower confidence, not too low, you have to make your own thresholds. Um, you might be able, you might be more willing to have that go in because you really need more data in that space. Or maybe you go and you talk to your um, sourcing folks and go and get more data sources that will then uh, support that area. And so that information would be helpful to know when you are determining whether you're going to let something in or not, because maybe you just don't have a lot of data on that yet, um, which means there's going to be less sources corroborating it, but it's not necessarily because it's not trustworthy. It's because you just don't have enough data for it. Uh, refresh speed. This is important for uh, temporal facts. So LLMs suck when it comes to anything uh, time sensitive because they are trained on a point in time, which is why they have to use all these other resources to continue to feed it data, but also to supplement when it might not have the most up-to-date information, which is why if you're going through this, having again, that source information on how often does this get refreshed? How 
uh, how fast is it in getting, you know, the next uh, thing in finance that, that everybody's talking about? That is a really important thing to keep in mind with this. And also, there is a special process in here that we're going to go over for temporal data. You might not be able to do this same process for temporal data. You might have to have two pipelines like this or two uh, algorithms running uh, on your data where if there's a temporal, you have, first of all, temporal means there might not be data to support it yet. So, so you need to have um, a special cadence for temporal data because you need to get it in fast but you also don't have enough data to support it. So you, know, you have to think through that when you're doing this. Um, and then, you know, what is the impact of the graph itself? So um, if you add something in, is it going to add it? Is it gonna make uh, some of the algorithms that you have really gnarly? Like some of those things you might wanna think about too. And then new and valid uh, entities and statements, they are weighted, weighted, weighted higher because um, again, you wanna get the most up-to-date stuff coming in. And then anything that is uh, error, disputed, uh, or opinion-based statements. And you look at that from an overtime perspective. So that means after you've done this a few times, you're gonna start to figure out some sources or some statements show up with more errors or show up with more disputed. And disputed means that there's no definitive yes, no um, kind of statement on it. Um, or things that are opinions where it's not really corroborated with evidence. Um, you you can see that over time. And so you want to uh, factor that into your trustworthy weighting as well. Let me just talk about this temporal piece for a second since we were touching on it. So if the confidence is not high enough or maybe there's not enough data to support it, it then goes back into the queue for reevaluation. And you want to do reevaluation on something um, at least one to three, every one to three months. Um, and then for evergreen, which is that don't change very often, that would be maybe six to 12 months. Again, it depends on your use case. If you need stuff really fast and you need that temporal information really fast, maybe it's an hourly or a daily refresh to say like, who else is saying this? Um, or maybe you have to skip some of these steps and just maybe put a statement or uh, something into your UI to make sure that folks are eyes wide open this has not been verified, or we don't have enough evidence to say this is accurate or not. You know, making sure that when you're doing this, that the the end consumers are aware of what uh, they can trust or not. So all of the uh, additional information we went over, like the need for the get the for the facts, uh, refresh speed, different sources that are, um, you know, giving you more error prone things or not, all of that goes into um, your final score, which you can see over here. So this is just talking about the source weighting, but then you have a different uh, assessment on this information on, you know, weighting the, the, the actual statements to give you your final uh, score as whether it can be uh, deemed trustworthy or not. And so you can see here, this first statement got a 0.81. The second statement was very high, remember, because it had a lot of high tiered sources anyways. So it has a 93, and then this poor statement only has a 32. And so this, this router is taking the calculation that happened in this trustworthiness box, and then it's routing it to the appropriate space. So if something was uh, given a very poor verification score and you set the threshold for that, it then sends it to a different process where it's flagged as, erroneous or do not use or something. And then again, not propagating bad data, you wanna send that back to the original data source so that they know that that's something that doesn't have a high confidence in. And it's up to you whether you release to them all the other ways that you were verifying that, but at the very least, you need to flag it in the original data source when it's coming in so you don't keep trying to reprocess uh, that statement. The high confidence stuff goes into the next piece, which is really important. And that is sensitivity check, error check, opinion, disputed, all of that. And so what this means is, again, using uh, behavioral data that you've seen through the past, so you've done this a few times, you're saying, okay, even though this statement is high confidence, 
Um, we've seen a lot of opinions start to show up or we've noticed that there's weirdly some sensitive data that's coming in from this source or for some reason we got an outside um, tip that this thing is, this source is no longer giving the same accuracy that, that we were anticipating. Like this is kind of your um, catch all of like if you need to put a whole lot more checks and balances in, this is the place to do that. And so if you're seeing things that do show up constantly that are not very good or they're disputed, again, you want to send that to um, the data source or at least send it to the folks who are ingesting the data source so they can flag it on their end. Okay, so when you send things to be human verified, it's a separate pipeline. And if you are interested in my human verification pipeline for machine learning and AI projects, I will make a video on that. But what you do is you can either send it to something like Mechanical Turk, where it's a survey where you at least send two statements and either they're the disputed statements or statements that don't agree on something. So maybe somebody uh, said in an article that um, a certain level of vitamin C causes back pain or something, but a different article says it's a different level or if it, it says it doesn't cause back pain. Um, those conflicting things are the things that you would want to send uh, through to human verification. Now, with something like the one I just used, which is medical-based, you might want to have SMEs. So there, that would be a different type of, of pipeline where you can still use the same human verification pipeline, but you would have SMEs for medical specifically looking at this thing. But humans make lots of errors too. And also, especially if you're using Mechanical Turk, people wanna get paid and so they just answer willy-nilly and it doesn't really help you. So to avoid that, uh, one way to do it is to ask them to give the source to where they found this. Um, and that can be a citation, you know, if you're they're using Google Scholar or something, you know, get citation real fast or the link to um, the article or the website that they were using to verify this. So one, that helps you identify new sources if you don't already have them. If you do have them, you already have a trustworthiness score, right? So then you can understand if this um, this this human, you know, that's been answering um, was looking at a tr uh, an authoritative source or not. And then it also helps you identify bad actors in your human verification loop. Now, obviously you're not gonna be sending sensitive data to uh, the human verifiers. And so if something is deemed sensitive, like I said, it gets sent to a different, it gets routed out, it gets taken out of the data sources and all of that. And then if something is deemed, one of the statements is deemed um, accurate or at least uh, evidence-based, there's others that, that can verify this is accurate, um, then this statement can finally be deemed verified and it would get a flag of verification with a date and the sources, right? We want to be able to backtrack everything that we do here. Then it can go into your knowledge graph and it can live and breathe and, and, and have a good time and get verified again on an annual basis or whatever basis you need to meet your use case requirements of trustworthiness. Um, and of course, if you start to see some of those errors from downstream applications, whether it's LLM or recommendations or reports or whatever, um, then this will kick off all over again. All right, so I know that was a whirlwind. I hope this has been very helpful. If there was anything that I went over because there was a lot to unpack in this video, please leave some questions down below and I will be sure to answer them. I do regularly check the comments. And also, if you have any additions to this process that you have found helpful, please let me know. All right, so with that, I wanna thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.